Welcome back to Presbyterian Journey. I'm the Reverend Lucas Levy Keppel, and this is the second part of our series. In its entirety, it is a great overview for anyone on their own Presbyterian journey. Like all long-distance journeys, though, we can't spend too long in any one place. If anything we discuss today causes your heart to be strangely warmed, I encourage you, leave a comment and or reach out to your pastor, who can give you much more in-depth resources. Last week we talked about the origins of the creeds in the early church, spending some time metaphorically in Rome and Nicaea. This week we're going to jump ahead by about a millennium, and also head to the Holy Roman Empire, specifically the town of Wittenberg, where a certain professor and Augustinian monk named Martin Luther is preparing to nail his 95 thesis statements to the door of the cathedral. Before we can dive into Luther's story and kick off the Reformation, we need to understand some of the seeds of the Reformation from a few centuries prior. In England, a seminary professor at Oxford named John Wycliffe shocked the established Catholic Church by translating the Bible into English. Wycliffe believed that Christians should rely solely on the Bible for their understanding of God, a truly radical statement in the 14th century where church tradition was often held not just as equal but more important than scriptural support. Wycliffe saw many clergy who were illiterate reciting passages from memory without understanding, and he particularly was concerned by the fact that clergy and churches were getting rich from their privileged position in society, rather than helping the poor. John Wycliffe's work was published widely in England, but was slow burning in the rest of Europe until a man named Jan Hus translated them into Czech. In Czechia, the idea that the Bible should take precedence over tradition caught fire and spread widely. Hus spoke out against the practice of indulgences, a church tradition that encouraged people to pay money to the church in exchange for salvation from purgatory for their relatives and friends. During Hus's lifetime, a papal schism left the Catholic world with the scandal of multiple popes at the same time, all elected by the College of Cardinals and each believing themselves to be the true pope and head of the church. Hus spoke out boldly that the true head of the church for all time was Jesus Christ, not any of the people claiming that authority on earth as Pope. Jan Hus was burned at the stake as a heretic for his views, but people remembered his teachings and the people following them were called Husites in his honor. After Hus's death, the philosophy of humanism gained ground in Europe and a Dutch priest named Desiridius Erasmus published the work of Wycliffe and pushed it just a little bit further. Although Erasmus did not publish a translation of the Bible in his own language, he did use the academic scholarship of the humanists to publish a new Latin translation of the New Testament, side by side with the original Greek text, the first time in over 700 years that a new Latin translation had been made available. Now, Martin Luther, in turn, was inspired by Erasmus's translation and the ideas of Hus and Wycliffe. After arguing strenuously that the practice of indulgences uh, was a bad idea, he finally published his 95 thesis statements, as well as nailing them to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral on Halloween night, 1517. In these statements, he argued the following points. Indulgences are immoral and ineffective, and the practice should be ceased immediately. Salvation is a gift of God's grace, that it can't be earned through our work, but only given by God. The Bible is the only source of knowledge of God that church tradition should hold no weight whatsoever. Everyone baptized as a Christian is a priest, that there is no need for inter intermediary intercession through the saints, but instead all have access to God directly through their prayers. And lastly, Luther argued that clergy should be able to marry and have children. 
when Luther was declaimed as a heretic, he was brought before representatives of the Catholic Church in the city of Worms and forced to argue his position. Luther did so brilliantly before the council or the Diet of Worms, and when asked to recant, he famously stated that everything he said was based solely in the Bible. Here I stand, I can do no other. Before the church could excommunicate and execute him, Luther fled into the court of a prince of the Holy Roman Empire, who offered political protection and turned away representatives of the church. The Holy Roman Empire was an unusual system of government, with princes, kings, and bishops maintaining rough autonomy in their states, while electing an emperor to rule them all. Because of this, Luther found himself protected from the church, since many of the German princes felt that the Italians, like the church, were claiming too much control of the empire. As a result, different parts of the Holy Roman Empire either supported or repressed Luther's idea, leading to a series of popular uprisings and societal upheaval that we call the Reformation and Counter-Reformation today. There was a lot of difference among the leaders of the Reformation, but eventually they rallied around the five solas, named after the first word of each statement in Latin. Sola fide, in faith alone are we justified in Christ. Sola scriptura, by scripture alone do we come to know God in Christ. Sola Christus, through Christ alone has atonement been made. No greater sacrifice is needed for salvation. Sola gratia, by grace alone is salvation granted, and we cannot earn salvation through our actions. Soli Deo Gloria, all is done to the glory of God alone. You see, worship is not entertainment, but a means of glorifying God. One of the other changes begun in the Reformation was the reduction of sacraments from the seven of Catholic doctrine to the two among the Protestants. Perhaps the biggest sacrament to be removed in Protestant thinking is marriage. It wasn't that Protestants didn't marry each other, far from it, as even Luther argued for marriage, even for clergy, but rather that marriage was not on the same level as baptism and communion. As a result, divorce became much more readily available and understood, even if it was not encouraged. Sacraments are signs of the real presence and power of Christ, and the Reformers argued that only those that were directly instituted by Christ were valid. These two were baptism and communion, which were scripturally supported and directly commended by Christ. Both baptism and communion were intended to seal believers in redemption, renew believers in their identity as people of God, and mark believers for service to God. The Reformers argued about the way that God accomplished these things in the sacraments, because of course they did, and these arguments ultimately were not reconciled together. Today, the different Protestant denominations maintain differing understandings of the sacraments which complicates efforts to unite the denominations together. There's so much more that could be said about the sacraments of baptism and communion, but we need to wrap up for this week. Our journey will wind its way from Wittenberg to the Swiss city of Geneva next week, as we learn about Jean Calvin, the Second Helvetic Confession, and the Doctrine of Predestination. I hope you'll join us then, and remember to subscribe to the channel if you want to receive notifications of new videos in this series and other opportunities. Thank you for watching. I'm Lucas Levy-Keppel. Have a blessed day.